Thank you for choosing to listen to our Faith Family Church podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, you can visit our website at ffcackworth.com. Thank you so much again for listening. Amen. We've been doing this series of messages and I'm excited. These are the theme scriptures that I was using at Deuteronomy 28th chapter. It's where God came to Abraham and God gave Abraham uh, a challenge. He commissioned Abraham, he made commandments as well, and then he made a promise to Abraham. If you'll honor my word and do these things, I will do this. And, and of course, this promise we see is more than a promise because, or it's more than a commission but, and, and more than a covenant, but it's a promise made by God. And God promised something to Abraham, and he has already by faith fulfilled it. He fulfilled it in the life of Abraham, and now he's come to fulfill it in our lives. Galatians, the third chapter, and let's go there this morning. Galatians, the third chapter, just verse 26. I'm going to start there and go down to 29. For you are all sons through faith in Christ Jesus. Are you a son this morning? Are you a daughter this morning? Are you a child this morning? Yes. Come on. Are you a child this morning? Yes, sir. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ have put on Christ, therefore, or there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ. Now listen to this last verse. For if you are Christ, or in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So the promise that God made to Abraham wasn't just for Abraham, but it's for all those that are in Christ. Amen? Amen. And we're heirs of that. Amen. So that's what we've been talking about. We've been looking at these thoughts what is a blessed life? Why is it better to live in blessings and miracles? We talked a little bit about if we go back into the story of Joshua. Uh, God fully intended for Moses and Joshua and all the people of Israel to cross over and live in that promised land. But unfortunately, because of their sins, for 40 years, God had to create a miracle for them. And for 40 years, it's the longest miracle we know in Scripture and have known to men it, was, it went on for 40 years. God provided for them in the wilderness. Amen? And instead of living in the blessed life, instead of living in that place of blessing, they had to live in a place of always want and need because they were looking for a miracle every day. And God would rather us, again, live in blessings so you don't have to always believe for miracles. But when you need to believe for a miracle, know that God is a miracle-working God. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with the miracles. I'm just saying, I believe, and according to God's word, we see that it was really intended for us to live in that blessed light place. Amen? <coughs> we took to talk a little further about it. And today I want to continue on the process about how it is or what it is to live in that place of blessing. And I want to finalize it with probably the most important part of the, the messages of this series is this one of communion with the Holy Spirit. How many know that the Holy Spirit is not just a thing or an it, but he is a person of the Godhead? Go with me to 2 Corinthians this morning. 2 Corinthians. I want you to go to the 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians, the last chapter. In that last verse, I want to show you the conclusion of all of what Paul had been teaching to the Church of Corinthians, he went through the book of Corinthians and he talked about the gifts of the Spirit and he taught about the gifts of the Spirit and he gave us all the ins and outs of it. He talked about the love of God and the power of that God, love that, is, that transcends everything else. It's more powerful than sickness. It's more powerful than absolutely anything, the love of God. Amen? And then he comes with the salutation and closes out the letter to the people of Corinth and he closes out to you and I and he says this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the communion. Please underscore that if it's in your Bible written in some other fashion. Uh, but in mine it says, in the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about that in reference to we know that God the Father is at the, right, is at the throne of, of, of God. And that we know that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession. But we also know that Jesus dwelleth in us. The Bible says that uh, no longer I live, but Christ liveth in me. What does that mean to have Christ live in me? Well, here's the third part this morning. It is the third part of the Trinity, the third part of the Godhead, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it, okay? 
He's not an it here this morning. He is a person. He is the third individual of the Godhead. If you go to Genesis, all at the beginning, we see at the beginning when God created the heavens and earth, we find the Spirit of God roaming the face of the earth, as well as when he said, let us make man in our image, talking in reference to somebody more than just God himself. And, of course, we know that later on as we follow the Scripture, we understand that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. But we need to know that, again, when I talk to you about, and I've said this before, that we've often believed for prayer, and in our prayer we're always believing for miracles and, and healings and deliverance or whatever you're believing for this morning. We often pray like God's a million miles away. And the Bible says that God dwells within us. How does he dwell within us? By his spirit, okay? And we talked about the spirit. When I got born again, the spirit man versus the flesh, okay? We talk in reference to that, and I want to reiterate some thoughts So where we're going today. In case you're new and you're, you're, this is the first message you're hearing on the blessed life, I'm trying to give you some insight. But the Holy Spirit is not an it. We, have, we in the Pentecostal arena for years have kind of been guilty of, of seeing the Holy Spirit as a gift, which he is. He is the gift of the Father and Son to us. But you need to understand it's not just the gifts, the nine gifts of the Spirit, in the, 11, uh, the 12th chapter there where he, in the book of Corinthians where he's talking to the people of Corinth, it's not the gifts that he's referring to as the Holy Spirit. What he's referring to is the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And God the Father is in, at the throne room and Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession, that intercession of redemption for you and I. But now we have the third person. Jesus said it's important that I go to the Father that I can send you the Comforter, the Comforter being the Holy Spirit. And so we need to understand that he is a person. He is not an it. It's not just a gift, okay? Too many times we refer to him, again in my notes here, we refer to him as an it. Let's go to the book of Acts, the second chapter, verse 1 through 4. Just let's look at what happened at the day of Pentecost, and then we're going to move on. Um, but I want to emphasize uh, the reality of him being a person. In fact, let me not get ahead of myself. Let's back up. Just go to the first chapter. Let me, let me show you something. Let me go to the third, first chapter of the book of Acts. Verse 1. For the former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after, after he meaning Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, have given commandments. So how did he give commandments? Through the power of his Spirit, to whom the apostles, I'm sorry, to the apostles whom he had chosen. So we're a chosen people, okay? To whom he also pre uh, presented himself alive after suffering of many infallible proofs. So we know that Jesus, after resurrection for 40 days, He's speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, he commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise. He promised someone of the Father. Now it's a promise of the Father to, through the Son to you and I, which he had said, you have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And therefore when they had come Together, he asked, and here we, we were looking this past weekend, a lot of people had been prophesying not to make fun of or criticize, but what happens if Jesus would have come Saturday, the 23rd? Many had prophesied that Jesus was coming on the 23rd. Were you ready? Were you ready? Now, we know that here because what he says here, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season. Now, I, you know, we can debate back and forth as to what people might believe there and their observation of the word. And there's a lot of scripture supporting that we can know a lot more than what we realize. These signs and these things are not just coincidence happening. This is not all these storms and rumors of wars and all this stuff are not just coincidence, signs of the end time. You read it in the book of uh, Matthew, the 24th chapter, that we are living in a time when things are very precarious. We don't know what could happen with our economy. We don't know what could happen within war. We've, we've got all kinds of terminal building to the point of threat against us as United States, and there's so many other things happening. But the question I have for you, even though Jesus said it's not, time for, it's not necessary for you to know this time or the season, 
for that's with the, with, put with the authority of the Father. But the bottom line is, are you ready? Do you know Jesus Christ is Lord of your life? Now here's the point that I want to go to, and I don't want to get away from my message this morning. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses in, to me in Jerusalem, and to Gia, and to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I'll tell you what, what the 23rd meant to me. It just charged me all the more to realize I'm running out of time. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of ground to gain. I'm looking at all these empty seats here. We've got to fill these seats up with souls that need Jesus. Amen? God's opened the high schools to us. He's opened the elementary schools to us. And he's opening up neighborhoods to us. That Halloween outreach is, that outreach is for a reason. I want to bring new souls in. I want to see new faces in. Why? Because I'm somebody special and I have all this wonderful music and I have all this wonderful building. No. Because I want to make sure that those souls make heaven their home as well. Amen. They need Jesus. We need Jesus. I'm thankful. There was a Baptist minister that ministered to me one day. I'll never forget it. I was on the side of the road as a young man working. And I had been in and out of the church and struggling. I had, uh, you know, I'd given my heart to the Lord at age 13. But by the time I was 15, 16, I was in a mess. I had allowed myself. I made choices that took me away from the things of God. And I'll never forget the day I was out there working for a company that I had been working for. And a Baptist minister turned around. I, wa I saw this car. I saw the guy look at me. And then he spun around. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of strange. Well, maybe he wants to know something about the company here. You know what he did? He walked up and he said, son, he said, I, I felt the presence of God tell me that I needed to talk to you about my Lord and Savior, Jesus. I'll never forget that day. It's the first time that anybody ever gave me the gospel that I didn't know. Somebody that was a stranger. I'd been to church all my life. The pastor always told me about Jesus and everybody, my Sunday school teachers and all that. But somebody, a stranger, anointed of God, stopped to tell me about Jesus that day. And I'll never forget that moment. Yeah, it, even though I still was kind of rebellious at the, the reception that day of the word, I'll never forget the moment that the man was faithful to hear. And that's the point I want you to talk about today. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, you need to understand that you can have communion with him. You can converse with him. He can talk to you and you can talk to him. How in the world does he talk? Do you hear with an audible voice? I've never heard an audible voice, but I've heard the Spirit of God so strong within me. And how he speaks, he speaks through his word, he speaks through prayer, and he speaks through me being still and know that he is God. Amen? <clears throat> We're going to look at this, but let's look a little further here this morning. <clears throat> the Godhead three in one. If we go back to the book of Galatians there, uh, and just or, or book of Corinthians, not Galatians, go back to the book of Corinthians, that last chapter there. What does it say? In that verse, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verse 14. What's it saying there? I'll, I'll get it. Hallelujah. For the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's God the Son. And the love of God, that's God the Father, if you're looking at my notes up on the screen. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Why did Paul write this? Well, you know, again, you know, everything that we, we need to understand, everything about this word, the Bible, is ordained by God. It's literally the voice of God to man. Okay? It is the voice of God through the heart of a man named Paul and through Timothy and through uh, Peter and through John and, and Matthew and all the different writers, over 40 writers, brought this word together over 1,500 years of time and yet this word seems to just flow together so beautifully. Why? Because it was ordained of God to speak these words. So Paul didn't just say something to make it sound good, but he said something with specifics. And the specifics are, you see Jesus the Son, you see God the Father, and then you see the communion in a marriage <clears throat> between a husband and wife. It's a covenant. It's a covenant relationship. And to help us understand the covenant that we have with God, we need to look at covenants that are naturally before us, and one in particular is the marriage covenant. The Bible talks about that husband and wife becoming one flesh. They become intimate in the fact that they become one, in, 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 in maybe not in the flesh, but in the spirit, we become one. In the likeness, and the, the like thinking here, that's what he's talking about. When you commune with somebody, 
It needs to be an intimate, not a perverted thing in the thinking of somebody perverting your thoughts here about it, but it is similar to, very similar to, the covenant relation you have between a husband and wife. It is a partaking together. We are all partakers with Christ. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, verse 16 through 17, that it talks very clearly that we are partakers. We are in one with him, okay? Now, how do we do that? And I'm going to look at three thoughts this morning. One, in communion, it's fellowship or companionship or to share together in all things. One of the things my wife just cannot stand, if I'm gone all day and I'm doing my thing and she's doing her thing, when we get home, for her to ask me, "Hun, how was your day today and what happened? For me to simply say, oh, it was fine, everything's good and just a normal day. Uh-uh, that ain't enough. How many guys know that ain't enough? If, am, I, am I the only one? My wife wants to know all the details. Why? Because she's intimately involved with me. She, has, she wants that communion. She wants to know what's happening within my life. And, and it's quite interesting. We just can't, we just can't. And, 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 and when we wake up in the morning and we present ourselves anew and afresh, do we really take time to commune with God or do we automatically just thrust ourselves into the business of the day. You went to bed thinking, man, I've got this job tomorrow. I've got to pick up this. I've got to go here. I've got to do this. So in the morning when you wake up, you get your cup of coffee. You might say, good morning, God. And then you're out the door running your schedule. You know, what happens to us is we're not communicating and we're not communing with. And it would be horrible to come home every day to a relationship with a husband or wife and none of them communicate. It would be horrible to get in the car and drive around and never communicate. Now, I've had a few moments like that, and I knew I was in trouble because if my wife is silent in the car for any amount of time, I know I'm in trouble, okay? But the point is, it's, it's foolishness to think, and it's foolishness to know that if I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and the way I maintain that relationship is by his spirit, because Christ is at the seat, seated at the right hand of the Father, and he said it's imperative that I, I go home to be with the Father, so in turn I can send the one that I promised, the one that the Father's promised, and he is the Holy Spirit. And it would be kind of ignorant to get in the car every day, and this is how rude we are sometimes. Did you ever get in the car with somebody and they maybe don't want to talk, so they turn up the radio and they just run it, run it, run it? And the whole time, well, okay, I thought we were going to talk, so you try to turn it down to talk, and all of a sudden they turn it back up. They don't want to talk. But I wonder how many times we do that to the Holy Spirit. We get in the car, and instead of taking time to maybe, maybe this is the moment I can commune with him, I turn the radio on and worship God. And there's nothing wrong with turning the radio on and worshiping God. But if we're not listening, if we're not speaking and listening, if we're not expecting the communication, then it's going to be a breakdown. We're not the partnership. We're going to talk about fellowship. We're going to talk about partnership to con contribute one to the other. I'm contributing my, hey, I contribute to this relationship. I must, in a relationship with my wife, I must contribute as well as she contributing together. We do it together. And we need to understand that the Holy Spirit wants to contribute to your life. And how bad we need him to contribute to our lives. Amen? He's the one that convicts you out of sin. He's the one that keeps you out of sin. He's the one that brings healing to your body. He's the one that brings restoring to your soul. He's the one that makes you that overcomer. He is that one that we desperately need to communicate and have communion with, and we do with intimacy. Now, let's break it down a little further. Let's talk about fellowship. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Companionship is simply to be there for each other. Book of Acts, the 20th chapter, you'll find a story there where Paul is warned of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's quite interesting. Paul, and, and this is what was so, I, I've often wondered why we struggle so bad with the church world today and seeing the signs and wonders that they saw back then. And I think this is probably the biggest reason why we're not seeing is because we're not in communion every day with the Holy Spirit like they were. These guys, as you read through the book, and, and, and I, I challenge you, read through the book of Acts today, just that alone. You're going to see where these guys literally had communication they talked. They heard the voice of the Holy Spirit at many a times, many occasions. Paul is told when he's going out in the ministry, Paul said by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, hey, Paul, now when you come into this community, know that they're going to imprison you. 
they're going to beat you, and they're going to try to kill you for the cause of Christ. Well, boy, that's real encouraging. That makes me want to go on that trip real soon. How many have ever wanted to go on a missions trip and you know that they're going to put you in jail, they're going to, they're going to beat you, and they're going to starve you in, in the prison and just barely give you enough? How many are looking forward to that trip? In fact, I'm planning a mission trip, and we're going to go down to Mexico, okay, our best friends in the United States of America, and we're going to go down there and bless them, okay? And we're going to go down in an area that's very controversial. How many want to sign up for that trip? And guess what? You've got to pay your whole way there. You've got to pay for the building of the process there. How many are looking forward to that trip? Can I get you to sign up? Oh, and by the way, they told us that they're going to probably beat us. They're probably going to stone us. They're probably going to put us in jail for a while down in the prisons in Mexico. Now, I don't know. I visited some prisons in third world countries. In Guatemala, I was at a prison to minister to kids. I went to, and believe me, they're nothing like the prisons we have here in the United States. Believe me, all I remember seeing is just a cold, hard cell, hardly any furniture. If there was any cot or any kind of bed, most of it was on the floor. And there might have been a sink. There was a bucket in there to use the bathroom, and that was it. There was no air conditioning. There was no nothing. And that's the kind of thing that Paul was facing here. The Holy Spirit actually had communion with him and said, Hey, son, just know for my sake they're going to beat you. They're going to do these things, but I need you to go anyways. See, that's, that's the partnership part that we're going to talk about further. But fellowship is to know that the Holy Spirit is there. Yes. That the whole time that Paul might have been in prison, the Holy Spirit was there. And the Holy Spirit was going through the same thing he was going through through the man's life, amen? That, that literally this man, and so the fellowship that we have, you need to know his voice. You need to understand he wants to speak to you. Has anybody ever had the voice of God speak to you? I'll never forget, again, I shared with you about the Baptist minister when I was a kid. I'll never forget that moment because the Holy Spirit turned him around. The Holy Spirit said, hey, that young man needs to hear my word today. I've got a calling on his life. Someday he'll preach the gospel. In fact, that's what that man said to me. He said, I, I sense that there's a calling on your life, and someday you're going to preach this gospel. And the whole time I'm thinking, man, dude, if you knew my heart, and you knew what I was in, and you knew how far I was from the things of God, there ain't no way God can fix all this mess in me. But I kept giving this smiley face and said, well, I'm already a churchgoer, and I'm already, I'm already a Christian, and I was so far from the things of God that day. I needed God desperately, and I thank God that God didn't come. I thank God that God's mercy and grace and his Holy Spirit met me another time in my life, and I did surrender and commit my way to him. The next thought I want to give you is partnership. Have you ever been in partnership with anybody? How many want a partner that never shows up on time? How many want a partner that never wants to help pay the bills? How many want a partner that's not faithful? How many wants a partner that when you call, you can never catch them on the line because something's happening with them? I, you know, there's always a problem. There's always a need. There's always, I, we don't want partners like that. None of us do. And thank God that's not the way he is, but that's the way we are to him. That's the way we are to him many a times. He wants to go forth, and he wants to go forth through you to take this gospel to a lost and dying world. But you don't want to be his hands today. You don't want to be his feet today. In fact, you want to lay in bed today because I'm too tired. The time is now for us to work, church. The time is now to be involved in this partnership. In the partnership, I love this. When you read these scriptures here, contrib uh, contributing one to the other. And listen there, down in, uh, it says, For it seemed, I love this part here. It was in the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. This is, kind of, this is Philip having this communication, and, and not just Philip, but then you, you got other disciples having this kind of communication. The disciples at this time, it seemed good to Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, I'm sorry, in this story it was Paul and Barnabas. It seemed good to Paul and Barnabas and to the Holy Spirit for us to go do what God's called us to do. But what I, I found very interesting, it, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Obviously, the Holy Spirit had been speaking to the men. And because the men said, and to us. Why? Because they had already been spoken to by the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you something. The Bible talks about in the book of, of, of Acts, who taught Paul? Who taught Paul? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Bible says that 
And, and you can say Christ, you can say God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because they're one. But the bottom line is, when Paul got born again and his life was turned around, the Bible says that the Spirit of God communed with him and taught him what he needed. And, and you'll find that's why Paul excels even past the disciples because the disciples were, the other disciples were struggling at the tangible world that they walked in when the Jesus was here. And Jesus would tell them things that they couldn't comprehend. And he would say, you can't comprehend that now, but someday when I go to be with the Father and I send the Comforter, he's going to help you understand. He's a teacher. And one of the gifts of the Spirit is a teaching gift, a gift of teaching that you can communicate, okay? And the Holy Spirit communicates. He's a partner with me. He's a partner with me. He has taught me many things. How many times I've, I've read the Word of God and it just seemed to leap out at me and the principles of life just became real to me because the Holy Spirit spoke them. I give you simple examples that the Holy Spirit has spoken to me many a time. Not just long ago, I, I was with my son and my son, he is college age right now and he's wide open, man. He knows no time to sleep. It seems like that kid is going 24-7. And when he come home for the storm relief, he, you know, I wanted to hang with him one day. And it was like pulling teeth to keep him with me because he had all these buddies he wanted to go see because he had a few days off. And I appreciate that and I understand that. But I was feeling a little bit neglected. I was feeling a little jealous. I was feeling like, you know, son, don't you want to be with me? And when I, when I made that statement in my mind, I didn't want to hurt him and I didn't want to offend him because I understand he's young, man. He loves me. There ain't no, in fact, he called me this morning. He called me specifically this morning to tell me, Dad, I'm praying for you. There's going to be anointing on your life today. God's going to bless in that church. I, I thought, wow, thank you, son. But, you know, how we want, and I'll never forget the moment I spoke that in my spirit, all of a sudden I heard the Holy Spirit said, I feel the same. I feel the same. I'm jealous for you, Donald. I want to be with you, Donald. But you're so busy. You want to do all these good church things, which are important. But son, the most important thing that I need with you is my time. I just want to be with you. And if we, if we in the natural can see how we neglect one another in relationship, in our partnership, how much more do we understand? And that last thought this morning is intimacy. Intimate with God. I love this story. The story of Philip here is Philip is called by the Spirit of God. Now here's, here's how distinct the voice of God is. The Bible says in that first verse there that it was an angel of the Lord that spoke the first, the first to Philip. The angel of the Lord commissioned him. He said, hey, Philip, I need you to go down. And then when he got down there, the Bible says then the Holy Spirit speaks to him as well. And there was a distinction of, an intimacy of. And it's quite interesting when we know one another and we know the voice of God, it's, it's sort of like, again, I know my children's voices. I remember, and even my wife's voice, I can pick out distinctly. There's a distinct tone and a sound. And there's some tones of her voice I don't want to hear. Amen? <coughs> but 90% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, I want to hear this. Just that one little percent. When that tone of voice changes and I know it's not the right pitch that I need to be hearing, I run because I know I'm in trouble about something. But I could be in a grocery store, and it's quite interesting. I'll do this quite often. We'll split up, and we'll go to a grocery store, and we'll split up. And she's getting something, I'm getting something. And, and you know, I'm one of those guys that kind of old school still, and I forget that I got a cell phone, so I'll just say, hey, Mel. i just say that out loud in people. And all of a sudden I hear, over here. And it can be as faint as can be, but I can hear her voice. It's a distinct voice. It's a distinct pitch because I've been intimate with her for many, many years. And I know her voice. I can pick it out in a crowd. Now, I, I, I'd like to believe in this crowd, if we were just kind of talking out loud and I had my eyes closed and she spoke, I'd like to believe I'd hear her. It all depends. My wife says I got selective hearing. <laughs> I'm going to smile on that one, too, because sometimes I do. Uh, you know, and I blamed on the fact that all these years I was around construction, all the noise of the tractors. <laughs> I don't hear good. I can hear good when I need to. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But the point is intimacy. Do you know his voice? Especially those that have been in church all their lives. Do we grow weary of his voice? Do we grow weary of the call upon our hearts to do this? 
I, I, I just find it so amazing that Philip would communicate with angels because the angels are there to minister on our behalf. We've got angels that are assigned directly to us as individuals, and they, they can go forth and minister on our behalf. And we, as even according to the scriptures, they're out to minister to us on our behalf in every way, even to the point where at times we can commission them by faith if we dare to believe. <coughs> but Philip was able to distinguish the difference between the angel and the Holy Spirit. And the one that we need to be more attentive to and more attuned to, because without the Holy Spirit, there's no hope for man. If you remove the Holy Spirit from any church, <laughs> there's no anointing to do anything. I don't care how good your shows are and how great your music is and I don't care how good the speaker is. There's no anointing to change his life if the Holy Spirit is not there. The Holy Spirit must be here. Amen. He must be within your life. He is the one and without him nothing is possible. With him all things. This prayer that Brother Mike gave for his wife Without the Holy Spirit, it couldn't be. But with the Holy Spirit, all these things are possible. Amen. 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 With our heads bowed and eyes closed, and I just want to meditate for a moment here. And if we could have some music softly play, I'd appreciate it. If you want to be an individual that walks in blessings, then I challenge you, walk in the Spirit. The book of Romans, the eighth chapter, probably the best chapter I can show you about what it is to walk in the Spirit. The Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the foolish things of this life, the lust of the flesh, the sinful things. But you'll walk with God, for God, for His purpose and His glory, His will. In closing this morning, the greatest prayer that Jesus prayed was a prayer in the garden. I think it's one of the greatest. He's saying, well, there's a lot of great prayers he prayed, but this one in particular always catches my attention. He said, not my will, but yours, God, be done. Because Jesus had a will just like you and I. He could have done his own thing. He could have made a choice to do his own thing. But he showed us the most important thing for any man is that we surrender our will to the will of the Father. Because when we do, then all things, it doesn't mean that everything will just be peaches and cream and there'll be no problems because the Bible clearly shows us just like the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul. Paul, when you go into Jerusalem this time, they're going to they're gonna imprison you. The Holy Spirit spoke to him and told him, hey man, there's a lot of imprisonments. There's a lot of beatings you're going to suffer for the cause of Christ, but I need you to go. I need you to go anyway, Will, uh, uh, Paul. <coughs> I need you to surrender your will to mine because the gospel must be preached. The gospel must be written, Paul. You realize when Jesus left this world, we might have had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the four Gospels, along with the writings of Moses. But it wasn't complete. It wasn't enough. We needed a guy named Paul to be arrested, his heart to be arrested by the Holy Spirit and to be transformed so he could write the book Corinthians and, and the book of Ephesians, the book of Galatians, and many others. Why? Because the Holy Spirit needed to communicate. God the Father, through his Son Jesus and through the power of his Holy Spirit, needed to communicate to man what they needed. And today he's done that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't come into this world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. How do I get saved? I simply get saved by understanding my need for God. Now, God, I need that relationship. I've been doing all these things in life and nothing seems to be working right. I keep coming up short. I keep coming up with a mess. Every day I wake up, it seems like it's getting worse and better. <clears throat> God, I need help. If that's you, the Bible says if you confess your sins and your need for God, He is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's simple. So if I come to Him and I say, Lord, here I am. I need you today. I ask you to forgive me. 
and come into my heart and live with me. What's happening is that Holy Spirit is drawing you in. That's the Holy Spirit. It's not your conscience. See, science today don't know how to describe the Holy Spirit, so they call it a conscience. What that is is the Spirit of God's drawing you. The Spirit of God's been trying to talk to you. He's been trying to tell you where your lack is and where your need is and how he can fulfill that need within your life if you'll let him. That's the Holy Spirit, and he's here today speaking right now. Not just to those that might need Jesus, but he's speaking to those that have been in Christ for years. You've known Christ for years, and God's been calling you to do something. God's been asking you to change your mind about something and go here or do that or whatever, God. Whatever the Spirit of God's speaking to him, here's how you know when it's the Spirit of God speaking is when it lines up with God's Word. When it matches God's Word, when it's spoken from the Word of God, because the Word of God is what we need to hear. And when we hear God speak through His Word to us, then we know that's the voice of the Holy Spirit ministering. So I'm asking, whatever your need is this morning, I want us to stand this morning. And whatever your need is, if you need Jesus this morning, if you don't know the, the promise of the Word that says that if today I were to die and live or pass from this life to the next, and a lot of people don't believe in life after death, but I'm telling you, there is life after death. How can I be so assured? Because I'm assured of God's word, and God's word clearly talks about it. That's either there's either an eternal life in God or there's the eternal separation from God, which is called hell. There's only two places, heaven or hell. And I'm asking you this morning, if you're not assured of your relationship with God, then these altars are open. Or if you're a brother here today or a sister here today, that needs more from God. Maybe you need to just pray through on some things. These altars are open. I'm going to ask that our prayer team would come now as well. And I'm just asking you, if you need Jesus, I'm, I'm asking you to come forward. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be afraid. If, if, if you need prayer for anything, whether you, maybe you're not coming to get saved, but you're coming to pray for the sick or, or you need prayer for your marriage or you need prayer for your children, whatever you need today, I'm inviting you to come. We've got a prayer team that's coming right now, and I'm inviting you to come this morning, and I'm asking that you just submit to God. And, and don't leave this place. Don't think that tomorrow might come because tomorrow might not come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's, let's sing, if we could, just sing a little song this morning. Thank you for choosing to listen to our Faith Family Church podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, you can visit our website at ffcackworth.com. Thank you so much again for listening.